In the last lecture, we began looking at the programming language scheme with the intent of learning how that language would provide a basis for describing procedures and processes, and thus for understanding computational metaphors for controlling complex things. In this lecture, we look at how to create procedural abstractions in our language, and how to use those abstractions to describe and capture computational processes. So far, we've seen primitives, numbers and built-in procedures. We've seen means of combination, ways of creating complex expressions. And we've gotten our first means of abstraction, namely a way of giving a name to something. But we're still stuck just writing out arithmetic expressions, as the only procedures we have are the built-in ones. We need a way to capture our own processes and our own procedures. So we need another kind of abstraction. We need a way of capturing particular processes in our own procedures, and that's what we turn to now. In Scheme, we have a particular expression for capturing a procedure. It's called a lambda expression. It has the form shown, an open parenthesis, the keyword lambda, followed by some number of symbols enclosed within parentheses, followed by one or more legal expressions, followed by a closed parenthesis. The keyword lambda identifies this expression as a particular special form. The set of symbols immediately following the lambda are called the formal parameters of the lambda. In this case, there's just one, the parameter x. The subsequent expression we refer to as the body of the procedure. This is the particular pattern we are going to use to capture a process. The way to think about this lambda expression is that it is going to capture a common pattern of computation in a procedure. It will actually build the procedure for us. The way to read the expression is as follows. To process something, multiply it by itself, and return that value. So in fact, this particular lambda expression captures the process of squaring. It says, if you give me a value for x, I will return the value of multiplying that thing by itself. In a second, we'll see how this happens. Notice that lambda expressions must be special forms. The normal rules for evaluating a combination do not apply here. Instead, the value returned by evaluating a lambda expression is the actual procedure it captures. Contained within that procedure will be a set of formal parameters and a body that captures the common pattern of the process as a function of those formal parameters. Now, where can we use such a procedure? Well, basically anywhere in our earlier expressions that we could use a built-in procedure, which for now means as the first element of a combination. For example, here's a compound expression with two sub-expressions. What is the value or meaning associated with it? The value of the first sub-expression we just saw was a procedure. The value of the second sub-expression is just the number 5. Now, we have something similar to our earlier cases, a procedure applied to a value. The only difference is that here we have a procedure we built, rather than a pre-existing one. We need now to specify how such a procedure is applied to a set of arguments. So here is a summary of our earlier rules for evaluating expressions. The only change is to amplify what it means to apply a procedure to a set of arguments. When the procedure was a built-in arithmetic operator, we just did the obvious thing. Now, if the procedure is something built by evaluating a lambda expression, we have a new rule. We take the body of the procedure, substitute the value of the argument in place of the corresponding formal parameter, and then use the same rules to evaluate the resulting expression. So let's go back to our example. Our rule says to replace the value of the second expression, 5, everywhere in the body that we see the formal parameter, x. This then reduces the application of the lambda expression to a simpler expression, shown here. Thus, this application of a procedure to a simpler expression allows us to apply our rules again. The symbol star is just a name for the built-in multiplication operation, and 5 is just self-evaluating, so this all reduces to simply 25. Thus, we see that our rules now cover the evaluation of compound expressions that include the application of procedures created by lambdas. In particular, the rules tell us to substitute into the body of a procedure for the formal parameters, reducing to a new expression, and then apply the same set of rules all over again until we reach a final answer. Thus, lambda gives us the ability to capture procedure abstractions, patterns of computation in a single procedure. But we don't want to have to write out lambda expressions everywhere. We need this particular procedure. Instead, we can combine this procedural abstraction with our naming abstraction. That is, we can use a defined expression to give a name to a procedure. In this case, the name square will be paired with the value of the lambda expression, or quite literally with the actual procedure created by evaluating that lambda. Then, we can use the name square whenever we want the procedure, since its value is the actual procedure. If you follow through the rules of evaluation for the last expression, you will see that we get a procedure applied to a number, 
and the substitution of the argument into the body of the procedure reduces to a simpler expression, just as we saw earlier. The second kind of special form we saw was a lambda expression. And lambda, we said, is our way of capturing processes in procedure. Lambda, well known to be Greek for procedure maker, is our way of saying, take this pattern and capture it together in a way that we're going to be able to reuse it. In our two-world view, if we type this expression in at the visible world, the computer or evaluator determines the kind of expression it is, a lambda expression, and uses the rule for lambdas to create the associated value. It's important to stress that the actual value created by the machine is some representation of the procedure itself. It contains within it information about what kinds of formal parameters it expects and what it should do when it gets those formal parameters, in other words, what its body is. That actual procedure object, represented somehow internally, is the value associated with the lambda expression. And what gets returned? Well, some representation that says, here's what I've made. In fact, it'll be a funny looking thing like this that says it's a compound procedure, something made by you, and where it actually resides in the machine so that we can get back to it. It's key to stress. Evaluating the lambda creates a procedure object within the uh, execution world whose value is then printed back out as some representation of that object. Now, let's look at the interaction between creating lambdas and giving them names. First of all, as we've seen, I can create a lambda expression, and the value returned by that expression is the actual procedure object. It's not executed, it's not run, it's simply created. If I actually want to use that procedure, I need to be able to refer to it. And the easiest way to do that is to simply give it a name. So I can define square to be the value returned by that lambda, which is the procedure. Remember, this creates a binding of the name square with the actual procedure in that environment. Having done that, I can now write an expression using square any place I would have used the lambda. The rules say square's value will be used in place of square, namely the actual procedure, and therefore I'll be able to do the right thing. And in fact, I can therefore create expressions either using square or using the full lambda expression written out. These will result in exactly the same behavior. Now, because this operation of both creating a procedure and giving it a name is such a common thing, we have a shorthand form of that that we will use throughout the term and in the text. And it's shown in this last expression. Here, there are really two things going on. This expression is the same as the second expression, and there's a hidden lambda that's being evaluated to create the procedure, and then the define is being used to associate the name square with that procedure. Let's look a little more carefully at that lambda special form then. The syntax is shown at the top. It has three pieces. It has the keyword lambda that says this is a procedure maker. The first operand here is a list of parameters, in this case x and y. It might be empty, it might have one, it might have two, and it might have many such expressions. And what it does is it determines the number of operands that are going to be required when we use the procedure. The second operand is what's called the body. In this case, it's that division of a plus of a couple of things into two. It can be any expression. And it is important to stress it's not evaluated when the lambda is created. It's just simply kept there as a si string of symbols that are going to be used later. It is only evaluated when the procedure is applied. Okay, that's the syntax of lambda. What about the semantics of lambda? Well, the semantics of lambda are really important, so we're going to put it on a whole separate slot. And I feel like I should be shouting this out, but it says that the semantics of lambda are that a value of a lambda expression is a procedure. It's an object that sits in the execution world, contains within it the information about what parameters it expects to be passed in, and what it's going to do when you give them to them, and that object is the actual value of a lambda expression. We've now seen most of the basic elements of Scheme. We're going to continue to add a few more special forms and introduce some additional built-in procedures as we go along, but for now we have enough elements of the language to start reasoning about processes, and especially to use procedures to describe computational things. So let's look at some examples of describing processes in procedures. First, what does a procedure describe? One useful way of thinking about this is as a means of generalizing a common pattern of operations. For example, consider the three expressions shown here. The first two are straightforward. The third is a bit more general since foobar is presumably a name for some numerical value. However, each of these is basically just a specific instantiation of a process, the process of multiplying a value by itself or the process of squaring. So we can capture this by giving a name to the part of the pattern that changes with each instantiation, identifying that name as a formal parameter, and then capturing that pattern as the body of a lambda expression, together with the set of formal parameters, all within that actual lambda. Now let's consider a more complex pattern, as shown here. In this case, there are two things that vary, so we will need two parameters to capture this, each with a different name. Otherwise, we could just do the same thing we did last time and replicate the pattern 
with the parameters in place of the things that change, as shown. But a better way to capture this pattern is to realize that there are really two things going on. One is the sub-pattern of squaring things. The second is the use of the results of two different squaring operations within a larger pattern. So we could capture each of these things within its own procedural abstraction, with its own set of parameters and its own body or pattern. Note that in doing this, we are relying on a property of a combination, namely that a combination involving a named procedure is equivalent to the pattern captured by the procedure, with values substituted for the formal parameters. And we see that where we use the idea of square inside of Pythagoras. So why is this a better way of capturing the pattern? The primary reason is that by breaking the pattern up into smaller modules, we isolate pieces of the computation into separate abstractions. And these modules can then be reused by other computations. In particular, the idea of square is likely to be of value elsewhere, so it makes sense to capture that in its own procedure and then use it within this larger one. As well, by doing this, we create code that is easier to read, as we use a simple name to capture the idea of square and suppress the unnecessary details. By so doing, we isolate out the use of a procedure from the details of its actual imp implementation, a trick to which we will return later in the term. Of course, there may be many different ways of modularizing a computational pattern, and part of the goal is to decide how best to do it. Here, for example, is a finer scale modularization of the pattern into procedures. Note how each procedure uses the previous one within its body, using that idea of abstraction to separate out the use of the procedure from the details. Now, let's step away from the specifics of this example and talk about the process we just used. In essence, we did several things. We identified modules are part of the computational process, which we could usefully isolate. We then captured each of those within their own procedural abstraction. And finally, we created a procedure to control the interactions between the individual modules. Of course, we could apply this process within each of the modules in a recursive fashion. Our goal now is to see how we can use this general approach to capture computational processes inside of procedures. Let's take another look at this idea of capturing a procedural description with our language for describing processes, namely lambdas. Remember our description of the process of finding square roots from the first lecture, shown here. Our first step in building code to compute square roots is to determine some good modules or stages within this process. Here we can see several. There's the idea of measuring whether our guess is good enough so that we can stop and return an answer. There's the idea of creating a new guess if we're not close enough. And there will need to be a way of controlling the process in which we use our new guess as if it were the original one and continue the process. So, let's build each of these abstractions using our idea of capturing common patterns within lambda expressions. Here is a rather naive way of deciding if a guess is close enough. We take the guess and square it. If the guess is good, then this should give us a value close to the number whose square root we are seeking. Here, abs is a built-in procedure that returns the absolute value of its argument, and we simply test to see if the absolute difference is small. Note how we are already using procedural abstractions. We have assumed that square is an abstraction for the process of squaring numbers. For improving the guess, we can just use the same approach we did with Pythagoras. We capture the idea of average, and we use it to improve a guess as described by the process. As before, we can see that average is likely to be a process that we will want to use in other places. So creating an abstraction allows us to avoid replicating the code in those places. Moreover, we stress that by building this abstraction, we seal off the details of the implementation from the actual use of the abstraction. For example, we could decide to change the implementation of average, such as that shown here. Doing so does not require us to make any changes to procedures that use average, however since those simply refer to the procedure, not to the internal specifics. Also note that the names of the parameters are internal to the lambda expression. We cannot refer to them outside the scope of the lambda. Here, we've changed the names of the parameters, but this does not affect those procedures that use average. The last step is to decide how to integrate these pieces together into a process that controls the steps of the computation. The basic idea is already captured in the process description. Given a number and a guess, we want to use improve to derive a new guess. But now we have to make a decision. Is the guess good enough, in which case we can stop, or should we continue the process? In order to make such a decision, we need a new special form called an if expression, which has three sub-expressions, a predicate, a consequence, and an alternative. Here is how an if expression is evaluated. First, the evaluator uses its rules, such as those we've described, to determine the value of the predicate expression. If that value is true, 
then the evaluator uses its rules to evaluate the consequence expression and returns that value as the value of the entire if expression. On the other hand, if that value is not true, then the evaluator uses its rules to evaluate the alternative expression and returns that value as the value of the entire if expression. So why do we say that this is a special form and not just a procedure? We'll let you think about this, but after the next lecture you should be able to answer this question. For now we will simply accept that if expressions are evaluated in this particular manner. So back to our process. We know from our description that the heart of the process should look something like this. We check to see if we're close enough, and if so, then we just return the value of the guess. Our if expression will handle that for us. If we are not close enough, we want to improve our guess using the improved procedural abstraction we built. But somehow we want that to then use that value as a new guess and repeat the process. How do we do that? Well, let's call this overall process of repeated improving a guess until we're close enough squirt loop. Then, if we're not close enough, we get an improved guess and simply do this again. Finally, we can assemble our squirt procedure. We just use this repeated process of improving a guess. All we need to do is get it started with some initial guess. As this may look a bit unusual. We have a procedure that refers to itself within its body in a recursive fashion. Can we be sure that this procedure will correctly evolve as we saw in the first lecture? In the next lecture, we're going to introduce a formal model for tracing the evaluation of expressions, especially expressions involving the application of procedures. For now, however, we can be a bit informal and walk through the steps of the computation. As an example, let's suppose we try to find the squirt of 2. Basically, we can replace this expression with the body of the procedure associated with squirt, where the formal parameter is replaced with the specific value. In other words, we reverse the process of capturing a pattern. So we are going to loop through the process using an initial guess of 1. Now, what does squirt loop do? Well, the pattern it captured was to see if we are close enough. Here we have the body of the squirt loop procedure with the, the specific values in place. For now, we don't care about the other sub-expressions of the if expression. In this case, we are not close enough. So we move to the alternative stage of the if expression, as shown. Now, this is just like a normal combination. We reduce the values of the sub-expressions, so we get the value of the improved guess. And then just repeat the process. We keep doing this until we get a value that's close enough that we can stop. So to summarize, we've seen that we can use the idea of a procedure to capture a computational process by finding good components or modules of the process, capturing each within its own procedure, and then deciding how to control the overall process of the computation. In the next lecture, we will return to this idea, looking at different ways to break a problem down into these steps.